Thanks, Alistair. Well, at least I can give you what this plant breed was thinking. So if I look back on my career, um, I was a white clover breeder uh, in the first half of my working life. Uh, and I wondered really why the uh, organising committee had asked me to coordinate this um, uh, work on uh, plant breeding. And I'm just, after the comments this morning, wondering whether they were just looking for a fall guy. Uh, but anyway, we'll move on. And uh, if the PowerPoint... Sorry, what was that? It's going to be much better if I have the PowerPoint, I've got to say. <laughs> I was just trying to think what my first slide was, and I can't even think what the first slide was, so I'm not doing well. I've got to say that there is a, um, a quite a cohort of co-authors on this paper. Uh, so, look, I don't represent any single plant breeding company or seed company. Uh, I uh, work for a subsidiary of AgriSearch. Uh, we do license technologies to seed companies, but I'm not here representing any particular seed company. And so I really don't have any particular beef in terms of uh, what, either, what any of them do or put forward. And I was interested this morning to hear the plea for tall fescue and coxfoot. I'm right off script here, guys. Uh, and, you know, I was really pleased to hear that. But when I look at what is, here we go, when I look at what is being uh, actually sold into New Zealand at the moment, about 5,000 metric tonnes of ryegrass is sold every year. Coxfoot, somewhere in the two to 300 mark. Tall fescue, about the same. So the demand is not there. And so you ask the question, well, why aren't seed companies and plant breeders doing more about coxfoot and tall fescue? It's a, it's a pure economic equation. Uh, people are buying ryegrass. Now, maybe the seed companies are forcing ryegrass on farmers, but I actually don't believe that. Uh, I suspect that, in fact, if farmers want tall fescue and coxfoot to, in fact, be the species of choice, they've got to demand it. And I can tell you, the breeders will deliver. Anyway, plant breeding for resilient pastures. As you can see, we've got quite a, a group of co-authors here. We've got two from overseas, from the US, who have been colleagues for a long time. So as we've heard, in situ grazing is our competitive advantage. And I believe it's something that we've got to continue to maximise and make the best of. And as that graph at the bottom shown, uh, pasture harvested or eaten explains the majority of variation in milk solids per hectare between farms. There's nothing new there. Um, that data's been around for over a decade. We also saw more data on the same uh, topic earlier on. For sheep and beef farms, uh, improved profitability uh, from increased, an increased animal growth and lambing rates has not come from higher stocking numbers. In fact, they've fallen over the last 20 or 30 years quite significantly but they actually make more profit now, and it's underpinned by more and better quality feed. Providing high-performing and resilient pastures is really something that plant breeders are looking to do. Uh, despite all the rhetoric we hear about failure, that is something that plant breeders are seeking to achieve. And here we define resilient uh, as the capacity to survive and recover quickly from periods of stress. Oops, wrong way. So what about our New Zealand pastures? We've got about 6 million hectares of farmed, high-producing grassland. But they're all introduced. None of them are indigenous, none of them are native. They all come from offshore, predominantly from Europe. And along with those pastures have been introduced a whole range of insect pests. Uh, they haven't brought their biological or biocontrols with them. If they had, they would have died on the way. Uh, so they have led to a very vulnerable pasture ecosystem. Our ryegrass and fescues are highly reliant on epichloe endophytes to aid persistence. And when I talk about um, epichloe endophytes in tomorrow's talk, um, I'll show you some photos of just how dramatic that can be. Despite what we've heard about tall fescue and coxfoot, and I've already, I guess, uh, indicated that I'm certainly not against those being used. Uh, no one is. 
uh, perennial ryegrass and white clover do appear to remain the dominant constituents of our improved pastures. There will be other species that will provide opportunity. We've heard about chicory and its deep rooting uh, habit, increased nutritive value, and we've also heard about plantain mitigating nitrogen leaching. Now, on top of that 6 million hectares, there's around about 8 million, give or take, of less productive, exotic, and some indigenous grassland, and that's mainly the tussock grasslands uh, in the South Island. Look, plant breeding has traditionally sought to improve on-farm productivity uh, and profitability, primarily through increasing dry matter production and feed quality and improving persistence, or a combination of all of those. Certainly when I was a white clover breeder, that's what we were looking for, was increased dry matter production uh, and increased persistence. Now this is overlaid with a triple bottom line requirement from our customers, and that adds complexity to plant breeding. Once you start selecting for more than one, two or three characters, your chances of success really are very difficult. So we're now looking at increasing environmental regulations, limits to nitrogen use, we've heard about that, protecting our waterways, uh, slope restrictions on winter cropping. And we're going to need to identify plant material adapted to predicted climate change and the effect that this will have on performance and current species that we're using. So what does the forage improvement process look like in New Zealand? And I've got a little diagram here, and this red box basically uh, is where the commercial seed industry sits. And at the moment, all our applied pasture breeders essentially sit in that commercial seed industry um, box. Uh, we have no applied forage breeders now funded by the government and universities, uh, all in CRIs. They are all driven now by this commercial imperative uh, to sell seed, get, a, get an income so they can invest more in plant breeding and symbionts. And by symbionts there, we're talking primarily about two areas. One is the endophytes, which I mentioned earlier, and the other is rhizobium. Uh, there is some input outside of that uh, commercial seed industry uh, through uh, availability of genetic material, um, some pre-breeding, uh, some symbiont technologies, and also uh, evaluation and identification of traits of importance. And we'll look at some of those in a moment. In fact, we'll look at them right now. There are a numerous uh, targets that we could seek. The question is, are they all achievable? And are some of them, in fact, mutually exclusive? So on the right, we've got a set of uh, environmental limitations around drought, heat, pests, diseases, uh, grazing pressure, and those are becoming increasingly important. We've heard about that many times uh, this morning and earlier this afternoon. On the left-hand side, we've got some of the more traditional aims, which are no less important, and so it's how do we actually integrate these vast set of targets into a breeding program? And the excess of any of these is related to the heritability of the trait. And in the paper when it's published, you'll see we have a table in there showing the heritability of many of these traits. And that will give you some guide as to whether they are in fact achievable. Just the next couple of slides, I want to look at highlights of plant breeding. Um, Tests have shown that, look, there has been genetic gain. Have we been able to harvest that on farm? That's a debatable point. But in test trials, gains of up to 1% or more per year uh, in dry matter yield have been achieved. Uh, this has led to um, calculations of estimated value um, of around about $15 to $20 per hectare per year in farm profitability since 1920. Are we seeing that in farmers' bank balances? It's, a, it's a, an open question. Um, there's no doubt that non-toxic endophytes in many areas of the country uh, have improved perennial ryegrass persistence along with palatability. So if you go back to the old standard endophyte, yep, it was persistent as heck, but the animals actually didn't like eating it. And that's why the plants were never grazed to the ground because there was a natural barrier there that stopped the animal grazing it further down. And there is evidence that, in fact, dry matter yield breeding, uh, or breeding for dry matter yield, has not actually reduced uh, perennial ryegrass persistence. I guess that will be a point of debate. Um, improved ryegrass nutritive value has occurred through use of tetrapoids. Okay, we've heard some say they don't persist. Well, maybe actually the animal is overgrazing them. That's not the farmer's fault. It's just the fact that this is very highly nutritious feed for the animal. 
uh, changes in seasonal yield distribution have been driven by the forage value index. And plant breeders have been very responsive to what that forage value index is saying in terms of where the value is being created. So if you compare to mid-heading diploids in ryegrass, the economic benefit of late-heading diploids is about $54 per hectare per year, and for tetraboids, about 232 Now, I know those come off um, uh, equations, and, one farm, and farmers might say, well, actually, that doesn't seem to add up to what happens on my farm. This is what, I guess you could say, through those models could be achieved. In terms of white clover, an area I'm reasonably familiar with, the, the whole drive of trying to get um, high yield and high persistence led to the uh, identification of plants with high growing point densities, stolen growing point densities, without reducing leaf size, which was an indicator of yield. And as you can see in this graph, with Huia being the old cultivar, a lot of the drive has been in this direction uh, in terms of getting increased stolen uh, numbers. So the processes of plant breeding, in other words, the means to an end. And look, I've highlighted here a number of the more recent developments that have, we hope will assist plant breeders to develop even better products for our farmers. The use of uh, hybrid vigor, um, speed breeding, this is where you can turn over more generations more quickly, uh, is an area that's being used very effectively in a lot of other crop plants. Can we use it in forages? Uh, genomic selection to improve uh, accuracy of selection and across a number of different traits is an area that is being developed and that is where the, the CRIs and the universities at the moment are adding a significant value to the breeding process. Methods of phenotyping, and here we've got a LiDAR machine being used to measure a whole range of traits in ryegrass that perhaps the breeder couldn't do as effectively or as, or as accurately. I've got gene editing down here at the bottom, uh, which is really around targeted gene changes for benefit. Um, we do have investments in this area, uh, as well as uh, the area of transgenic technologies. And if we're looking to reduce uh, methane production through plant breeding, then our transgenic and genetic technologies will allow us to do that. Uh, they certainly add promise, but it's heavily regulated, and at the moment, we cannot grow these in New Zealand. So what about the future? Second to last slide. Um, if you look back at uh, what was outlined by Easton in 2002, uh, where um, the challenge was around modest but steady productivity gains, the, cha the challenge has really changed for us today. We're now facing environmental constraints, uh, limiting inputs, we talked about nitrogen, increasing impact of climate, and the threats of invasive species. But plant breeding does have an important role to play in improving pastoral agricultural productivity whilst reducing our environmental footprint uh, in what will be a much more variable climate and which we hope will continue to sequester carbon. We've heard about breeding dry matter yield with less end fertiliser. It's going to be a tough ask, that's all I can say, because nitrogen actually drives our pastoral system. Uh, we've used, up until 1991, the sole input ra really was through white clover. Since then, we've had a huge increase in fertiliser in. That's going to level off and decrease. So do we go back and look at how we reuse our legumes more effectively in our pastures? The whole area of uh, sleeper pests. So these are pests that are actually in the country, but they haven't really expressed themselves because the climate is dumbing down their effectiveness. So what if we do get drier and hotter? Pests like the tropical armyworm could in fact be a huge problem for us in the future. We've also got public and consumer demands that we need to take account of. You know, our supposedly clean green image, how clean and green is it? Uh, the fact that we graze in situ, is that a real ad advantage for us in the market? Is the way that we develop and use our plants a significance? And we need to, to keep that in mind also in our breeding programs. And then we look at genomic knowledge and tools that have moved rapidly in recent years. Are we actually going to be able to integrate these? I'm sure we can, but are we actually going to be able to use them in New Zealand with our current regulatory system and the opportunities they provide to us? Thanks very much. <laughs>